Good morning and welcome to Sycamore Creek Church. My name's Kevin and I'm the worship leader and I'm really glad that you're joining us for worship this morning, online, whenever you're watching this. We are continuing our series on love and dating and heartbreak. And today we're talking about dreams and when dreams don't come true, can't come true, uh, which is experience that I think we probably all had if we're <laughs> older than a couple years old. We've all had things in our life and hopes and dreams that have not been fulfilled. Um, and since we're talking about dreams, we're going to open with a little discussion question about dreams. What's the last dream that you can remember uh, when you woke up in the morning? Um, and I've had some kind of just weird, terrifying dreams. I don't know how to put into words. But I'm going to go to my, my daughter, Naomi. Uh, this past Sunday, she had a dream that our dog had pooped on the carpet and then woke up very concerned that Libby was going to poop in the house and took her out and she pooped outside, apparently had to go. So we've, we've now view her dreams as some amount of, there's some amount of foretelling potentially happening with her dreams. So, uh, that's, that's a, a recent dream that's had an impact on my life. <laughs> you guys can share your dreams with one another, ones that you've remembered, if, they're, if you feel like you can really share them <laughs> in this case. <laughs> and, we're gonna, and then you can join with me. We're going to sing a song together.
let your mercy reign on us Grace and peace be with you. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm the pastor at Sycamore Creek Church in Potterville. I Thank you for being with us today. I'm so excited that you're with us for our online worship service. We're continuing in our series on love, dates, and heartbreaks. And today we're onto the heartbreak portion of the series. As we think about heartbreaks, we need something that gives us hope and that anchors us amidst the heartache of life, and, and that's Jesus. And as a worship practice that helps point us to Jesus and, and God's presence in our lives, we light a candle each week in online worship. I'm going to invite you at this time in our worship service to go and get a candle and to light it as an act of worship as I light my candle here in Potterville. Let's do that together. Today we look to the light of that candle as we address a difficult topic of heartbreak. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your presence in our lives, especially amid the difficult times, like when we are heartbroken. But God, whatever heartbreaks we might have today, we, we bring them to you. Whatever relationship difficulties we might have, whatever, whatever areas where we feel like our life is not going the way that we would like it to, we look to you today. We give that area to you and we give the struggle to you. God, we pray that in those areas of our lives that we would, we would experience your peace, that we would experience your comfort, that we would experience your hope today as we worship together. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to continue praying with me as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today, as I mentioned, we are continuing in our series, Love, Dates, and Heartbreaks. I'm giving the message today on heartbreaks, but first, here is our host for today. Hi, my name is Danielle Rausch, and I'm your host today. Welcome to Sycamore Creek Church in Potterville. We're glad you've joined us for worship. I invite you to get connected to Sycamore Creek Church to take next steps that help you along on your faith journey and to submit prayer requests. You do all those things by filling out a digital connection card at sycamorecreekchurch.org connection. Take a moment to do that. We'll refer to that connection card again later in the worship service. Connect with us for the first time and we'll send you a free book. We hope today's worship will be impactful and meaningful. If today's worship is helpful for you, take a moment to share it with your friends on social media. You can share the worship service and use our hashtag SCC Potterville. Today's message begins with this. Love, dating, heartbreaks, all very complicated. So how do you get it right? After all, great relationships don't happen by accident. Whether you're single, married, partnered, divorced, or remarried, this series can help. Most of us step into adulthood with some sort of schedule in our minds for things that are going to happen. A graduation, a marriage, a job. We not only have ideas about these things, we have ideas in our head of when we want these things to happen. We have a range in our heads for these things happening, right? Not too early, not too late, just right. It's like the three bears, just right. We have ideas for our work, for what it will be and for what we'll do and how we'll succeed. We have ideas for having or not having children. We have a schedule for retirement and what that will look like. And 
Well, this schedule or envisioning is particularly true in terms of imagining the future when it comes to our relationships, because no one envisions their future alone. That's not the future we dream of. Nobody envisions their future alone. When we picture the future, none of us is picturing us sitting there by ourselves. There's there's somebody there with us, right, in our picture of the future. And this is natural and this is normal. And as time goes by, some of our dreams might come true, right? And well, some of our dreams might come true for a while. And, and then at some point, most of us realize that there are dreams or wishes we've always had that can't come true. Ouch. Dreams that can or don't come true. This is heartbreak. And sometimes the reason our dreams can't come true is because it's our fault. Sometimes we're partially to blame. And well, at other times, we may do everything right and the relationships still don't work out. However it happened, romantically speaking, and let me be clear, this is a message on the heartache of relationships. A relationship never materialized for you or it just hasn't worked out. Maybe your spouse discovered or decided that they're going to live their life by a different narrative. They, they discovered a different narrative that doesn't include you in spite of those vows. Maybe your second marriage is starting to feel a lot like your first marriage. And maybe when you hear me say that, you think, second marriage? Are you kidding, Mark? I would like to try a first one. You may want a happy, fulfilling relationship, but it just hasn't been in the cards for you. And, and then to make matters worse at times, it can appear that for everybody else, their dreams are coming true. All your dreams have come true for someone else, but not for you. So here's the thing. If any of that heartbreak I'm describing here is you, I want you to hear this. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry because this is gut-wrenching stuff. It's heartbreaking and there's no easy way out. There are no easy, emotionally satisfying answers. There's not one single thing I can say to you that will suddenly take away all the pain of a heartbreak. Because a heartbreak is, well, heartbreaking. When our dreams don't come true, it is natural, it's normal for our heart to be broken. I want you to know right up front that I'm so sorry. We're continuing in a series today on relationships called Love, Dates, and Heartbreaks. It's a series based on a series from Andy Stanley in North Point Church. Guess what part of the series we're on today? Heartbreaks. <laughs> and okay, this might not be an uplifting and exciting topic, but this is really important stuff. We, we can't address relationships without addressing the negative part of relationships. That's when someone breaks our heart. Heartbreaks. There are two things that I want us to leave with today, and I hope to communicate this throughout our time together. The first thing is that a broken heart doesn't mean that you're broken. I don't want your broken heart to break you. I don't want your broken heart to leave you broken, and I don't want your broken heart to break your spirit. We've all seen what happens when that happens to individuals, and you are not broken. The second thing I want you to know is simply this, that there is purpose for you even when your dreams can't come true. There are dreams that we hope come true, dreams we wish will come true. And then there are certain seasons of life when we realize, uh-oh, that dream, not only is it not coming true, it can't come true. And I don't want the dreams that can't come true to squeeze the hope and to squeeze the life and to squeeze the sense of purpose out of you. Your life has purpose and meaning always. Now, this is not easy stuff. So as we get into heartbreak, let's pause a moment to focus briefly on a chat question on the positive. So here's our question. What has helped you to get through heartbreak? Let's take a moment and discuss that.
if you're a follower of Jesus, what I'm about to say next, I'm not saying so that you'll feel better and you'll think, oh, I'm all happy now. I'm so happy that you said this, Mark. If you're a follower of Jesus, there's something that you should know. And this frames our heartbreak and it frames the dreams that we have that can't come true, the dreams that do come true, the dreams that you don't feel like are coming true. And this comes from the Bible and from the men and the women who were no strangers to broken hearts and to dreams that would not or could not come true. So here it is. They did not choose the hand they were dealt, but they chose to trust in God anyway. You see, we sometimes forget that the people in the Bible, they had the same questions that you have and the same questions that I have, and they had the same struggles that you have and the same struggles that I have. And one area of struggle was looking around at their lives and questioning God. Why is this happening? Why isn't this happening the way I want it to happen? And these men and women, they were heartbroken and they trusted in God anyway. So as they trusted in God, despite their struggles, the impact that they had upon the world was tremendous. Because of these folks, I'm confident that regardless of which of your dreams can come true and regardless of how broken your heart is, there is always, always a purpose for your life. If only you have the courage to keep your hands and your heart and your mind open to God, God will accomplish God's will in and through you, even when your personal dreams can't come true. Now, one of the most famous people who experienced this is someone who we've all heard of, Mary, the mother of Jesus. When Mary found out that her world would not be the way she had anticipated, when she realized that her whole life was gonna be turned upside down and that her reputation in her very small community was shot, she trusted God. A prophet came to Mary after Jesus was born, when Jesus was very, very young. And the prophet said, Mary, I have a word from God for you. And a sword will pierce your very soul. I bet Mary thought, wait a minute. That's not what's on the little sticky note I have on my mirror at home. That's not my favorite Bible verse. The prophet said to Mary, no, here's God's word to you. A sword will pierce your soul. But you've not been abandoned and you're not cursed, and you are blessed among women. Mary's response again and again to the realization that her life would be nothing like she had planned was this, I am the Lord's servant. And then we have John the Baptist, the guy who set the stage for Jesus. He got everything ready so that when Jesus showed up, he would be recognized. And John the Baptist, when he realized his 15 minutes of fame was coming to an end, and not just any end, but an abrupt, violent end, he responded to those who brought this to his attention and he essentially said, this is horrible. This isn't my plan. This isn't how I thought it would play out. I, I certainly thought I would live a long, fruitful life. I thought I would see the king return. I thought I would see the nation of Israel restored. I, I don't like this at all. And I choose to still trust in God. Jesus, on the night of his arrest, and you've probably heard this story, he prayed and he said, God, if I wrote the script, the script would not look like this. And God, if I got to choose the plans for my future, it wouldn't look like this. And if you would, could you just maybe change the plan? Could you take this cup from me? But just so you know, Heavenly Father, not my will, but yours be done. They did not choose the hand they were dealt, but they chose to trust in God anyway. Heartbroken. It happens. It's part of life. And when we're there, we resist, we push back, we panic. When our relationship dreams aren't coming true, it can feel like God has abandoned us. Maybe this is part of your story. I'm so sorry. It's easy during heartbreak to let fear inform our decisions. It's easy when we realize that a dream isn't coming true, that maybe God isn't answering our prayer, that we lose faith and we give up. And when we're heartbroken, it's tempting to say yes to everything around us. We say yes to the next opportunity, even when we know it's not the best opportunity, even when we know it's not the wise thing to do in this season of life because we're desperate. So we try to make something happen. Or on the opposite end, when we're heartbroken, it's tempting to say no to everything and to close ourselves off. And all too often with either of those approaches, our desperation and our heartbreak lead to greater despair. But there's a different side to heartbreak. And Maybe you've seen it, maybe you've experienced it, maybe this is your story. Some of the most remarkable people I've met, in fact, well, maybe the most remarkable people I've met are the people whose lives didn't play out the way they thought they would, and yet these people somehow and in some way remained open and available to the possibilities of what God had for them. Maybe you've met these people, and again, maybe you're one of them. 
They're remarkable. They refuse to become cynics. They refuse bitterness. These people have learned something and identified something. They have resisted the part of us that feels we deserve blessing. Now, feeling that we deserve blessing is called a prosperity gospel. Maybe you've heard of this. It's the idea that if you give God one, God will give you 10. If you do this, then God will do that. If you keep your side of the bargain, God will keep God's side of the bargain. And lest we judge this idea too harshly, the prosperity gospel is there a little bit in all of us. Since I did this, then God must do this. And we love to balance out the equation of life in our favor. If I do the right things, then God will make the right things happen for me. And the challenge with the idea of the prosperity gospel is that it's very difficult to remain faithful when it seems that God hasn't upheld God's end of the bargain. What happens when our dreams don't come true? Now, this is not the original version of the gospel. This bargaining gospel is good news that's not really good news. This is a version of God that's easy to leave. This is the God who doesn't allow bad things to happen to good people. And that's easy to leave because the God who doesn't allow bad things to good people, that, that God doesn't exist. That is not and it has never been our God. In the center of Christianity stands the best possible person, Jesus. He was, he was perfect. And the worst possible things happen to that best possible person. I repeat that because many of us haven't thought about it this way. The worst possible things happen to the best possible person. Jesus didn't deserve any of the bad things that happened to him. Because Jesus did not come offering us an equation to be balanced. He came offering us an invitation. Jesus' invitation was to lose our lives in God so that we could find life. And then Jesus modeled this by laying down his life and taking it up again in resurrection. And Jesus' invitation then and today is simply this, come follow me. Follow me because of what I will do. And Jesus said, I want you to follow me because of who I am and because of what I've already done for you. And if we follow Jesus because of what he'll do, we've got an equation. The invitation of Christianity is not an equation. It's not an if you do this, then God will automatically do this. That's God as a cosmic vending machine. And the reality is way better than that. It's an invitation to follow your Savior because of what God has already done. This has been the standing invitation since the very beginning of Christianity. Come follow me. This is the invitation that has been accepted by so many brokenhearted people, people whose dreams would not and could not come true. Follow me. And here's what we discover. In Jesus is where peace is found. This is where striving ends. This is how we live our lives with our hands wide open, even when our dreams don't come true and our heart is broken. We did not always choose the hand that we are dealt, but we can choose to trust in God anyway. Now this way of living is a posture of thy will, not mine, be done. Now, the broken parted people who live this out, they are the people that change our world. They are the people that get the attention of other people. They are the people who have an inner sense of peace that surpasses, as the early missionary Paul said, all human comprehension, which means it just doesn't make sense. I hope you've experienced this peace or, or noticed this. Here's, here's another question for discussion. Who has inspired you from the Bible or from your own life experiences by trusting in God despite heartbreak? And why have they inspired you? Let's take a moment and discuss that.
Let me tell you for a bit about David, as in David and Goliath. David as in King David, because he learned all this stuff the hard way. I want to tell you a bit about the story of David's life because I think it will illustrate well what we're talking about today. And I hope it gets you thinking about your own life. Toward the end of David's life, he made an extraordinary statement, and it's a, a helpful summary of this idea I've been sharing of trusting God amid heartbreak. But the statement that he leaves us with only makes sense if you know his story. So I'm going to take some time to tell David's story. David shows up in the Bible as a shepherd boy, and one day the prophet Samuel comes to his house. And he says to this child in front of his whole family, David, God has chosen you to be the next king of Israel. But of course, Israel already has a king and this posed a problem. How would David become king? So David went back to keeping his sheep. And then one afternoon, David went to check on his brothers because his father had sent him to check on his brothers. They're all soldiers in the army of King Saul. And there was this extraordinary event where Goliath kept coming to the Valley of Elah and taunting the people of Israel and the armies of Israel. Now David realized that Goliath was taunting not only the armies, but taunting our God. And our God is bigger than the Philistine God. David eventually marched down into the valley and he slayed that giant, Goliath. Now overnight, David became almost a living legend, a folk hero, and that led to him being accepted into Saul's family. King Saul offered one of his daughters to David in marriage. David married the king's daughter. And he's already been anointed the next king. He's married to the current king's daughter. He's set for life, right? But then Saul realizes he's made a terrible mistake, bringing this legend into his family because people love David more than they love Saul. And that was a problem. That messes with Saul's plans to have his son, Jonathan, become the next king. So Saul kind of loses his mind. He becomes very angry. Saul tries to kill David and David flees for his life. He's forced to leave everybody he knows and everything he knows. He can't go home because he would put his own family's life in danger. And David's running for his life as a fugitive. His, his future goes dark and he's alone. He's abandoned and he's heartbroken. He doesn't know what to do and he panics. Now, David goes to a little village called Nob. Nob was populated primarily by priests and he has a friend there, a priest named Ahimelech. David goes to Ahimelech and he lies saying to Ahimelech, Ahimelech, I'm here on the king's business. Now Ahimelech responds, David, where are your men? Well, they're somewhere else. Don't worry about it. David, you're, you're here all by yourself. Why? I know it's unusual for me to be by myself. And, and by the way, I was in such a hurry to do the king's business that I didn't bring any food. Do you have any food? Oh, oh and I was also in such a hurry to do the king's business that I didn't bring any weapons. Do you have any weapons that I could use? Now, here's exactly what the Bible says about David. David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was urgent. Now, Ahimelech likely realized something was amiss here, but, but he trusted David. David lied to Ahimelech because he was panicking. Isn't this what we do when our hearts are broken? Isn't this what we do when suddenly things are slipping out of control? We panic and we'll say whatever we need to say to have our way. So David lies to his friend Ahimelech. And then something very dramatic happens. Ahimelech says, well, there's just one weapon here and it's a sword. It's a sword you're familiar with, David. The only weapon we have here is the sword of Goliath, who you killed at the Valley of Elah. It's here. Now Ahimelech then brings out a visual aid, a reminder of God's faithfulness to David in the past. A reminder that God had made David a promise. A reminder that God had invited David to trust God even when life didn't make sense. Because at this point in David's life, it didn't make sense. In this moment in David's story, and maybe this is where you are in your story, David wasn't looking back. David was looking forward. And forward felt dark. It felt hopeless. David felt helpless. And so he decided to literally take matters into his own hands. David said to the priest, there is none like it. Give it to me. This decision had disastrous consequences. It was reported back to King Saul that Ahimelech had aided the king's enemy and Saul showed up with a small army. Saul accused Ahimelech of aiding his enemy and King Saul was so angry, he had Ahimelech killed. And then he had every single priest in Nob killed, their wives, their children, and the Bible says, even the infants. Saul was so angry and so jealous that he killed 
everything in the village. And when David got the news of what had happened, he was devastated. Devastated. Heartbroken yet again. Yet again, his life and everything about his life became way more complicated. Everyone now knew that he had lied to Himelech, and he was to blame for what happened in Nob. Well, time went by, and David eventually did become king, and David had lots of ups and downs. David was a terrible father. He abused his power to take advantage of Bathsheba. He had a man killed to cover it up. David and God had their ups and downs. David trusted in God at times, and He didn't at others. And now David is toward the end of his life. And David found himself in an eerily similar situation with his favorite child, his son Absalom. Now Absalom would probably be the king after David died. Absalom, whom David adored. But Absalom was angry with his father, and rightfully so. So Absalom went out and undermined David's authority. Absalom plotted against his dad. He he raised up his own army. He stole the loyalty of the people. And then on a given day, he announced himself king. And he marched on the capital city to take the throne away from his father, David. So David packed up his family and he left and he abandoned the city. Uh, Once again, the future was dark. Once again, David was a fugitive, but, but now he's much older. And he's at war with his son, He's already lost two sons, and it looks like he's about to lose a third son. David and his people, they crossed the Kidron Valley, and and all the people moved on toward the wilderness, the very same wilderness where David had fled to from Saul when he was a much younger man. Have you ever felt like this was your life? Suddenly nothing's like it was. All the security is gone. The people you knew are gone. The people you leaned on are gone, and you're headed into wilderness. Have you ever felt like you're headed back into the same wilderness yet again that you experienced before? This is the story of the famous King David. And then there's the twist. You see, this sets up what David would say that's so powerful still today. So Zadok was there too with David, and he was a priest. All the Levites, all all the people who had attended the ceremony surrounding Jewish and Hebrew worship, they were with David as well. And they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God Because the Ark of the Covenant was important. The Ark of the Covenant was where the original Ten Commandments were housed and some of the very religious and very important artifacts of the early Hebrew religion. But the most important thing about the Ark of the Covenant is that it represented the presence of God. Whoever had the Ark had God with them. So Zadok decides to bring the Ark with them. This was their way of saying as a big visual that God is with us. God is on our side. God is not with the rebel Absalom. God is with David, the king. But really, it was a way to subtly manipulate the outcome. This was an equation faith. If we do this, God will do this. And David had learned his lesson. He was through trying to control or manipulate outcomes. He'd he'd already tried this as a young man fleeing for his life. And again, in the aftermath of his abuse of power and taking advantage of Bathsheba. In both instances, his panic and his desire to control outcomes resulted in bloodshed and extraordinary public humiliation. And David was done with that. So when David saw the Ark of the Covenant leaving the city, he said to Zadok, take the Ark of God back into the city. No more manipulation, no more negotiation, no more trying to get God to do my bidding. Then David said next, what is for you and what is certainly for me? David said, if I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it in his dwelling place again. But if he says, I am not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. God's will be done is essentially what David says. David did not choose the hand he was dealt, but he chose to trust in God anyway. David admits, this took me by surprise. This was happening now. This was not my plan. I'm an old man. I had settled things. I thought I knew how the rest of my story would play out. This took me by surprise. But it didn't take God by surprise. David admits, you know what? I I may have brought this on myself. If so, he says, let God do with me what God would choose to do. And in those words, David precedes the future words of Mary and of John the Baptist and of so many others who follow God where God leads. I will do my best and and I will rest in trusting in God. 
This is an interruption of my dreams and of my plans. It's not an interruption, though, of God's plans, which are way bigger than my own. God's will be done. Now, Zadok had trouble believing what David was telling him to do, so David continued. The king also said to Zadok the priest, Do you understand? Go back to the city with my blessing. You see, David reassured Zadok, and so Zadok took the Ark of God back to Jerusalem and stayed there, but David continued the journey. David continued up the Mount of Olives weeping as he went. His, his head was covered and he was barefoot and he was mourning with a broken heart. David had experienced tremendous losses. His future was dark. David had lost his dignity. He's lost his kingdom. He's lost his dreams. And somehow, in some way, and maybe you know people like this, David had not lost his confidence in God. David didn't abandon God, even when it felt like God had abandoned him. David trusted in God, despite what David was feeling. David had seen where fear and panic and manipulation and control lead. He tried that many times. And this time... David chose not to reach for Goliath's sword. This time he he chose not to take matters into his own hands. This time he didn't anchor his faith to the fulfillment of his dreams. Because let's be honest, when you anchor your faith in God to the fulfillment of your dreams, you set yourself up to lose your confidence and your faith in God. So here's the invitation today to all of us. And this is not a one-time invitation. This is a daily invitation The invitation is to declare to God, here are my dreams, here are my plans. They're my dreams and they're my plans. God, do with them as you wish. And you do with me whatever seems good to you. No bargaining, no equations, no negotiating. You know my desires, you know my hopes and dreams. I will trust you. This is what the New Testament calls casting our cares on God because we know that God cares for us no matter what. God, you know my desires, but I acknowledge your right to lead me. You lead, I will follow. And that leads us to a challenging question where this gets really practical for our lives, for our children, for our grandchildren, for our spouse, for our family members. Here's our final discussion question today. What relationship dreams do you have that you can entrust to God? Let's take a moment and discuss that. The truth today is this, even if your heart is broken, it doesn't mean you're broken. Even when your dreams can't come true, it doesn't mean that God doesn't have some significant purpose for you. The men and women who brought us the story of Jesus, they they didn't remain faithful because they hoped hard enough and what they dreamed then happened. No, our plans for the future are uncertain. They knew that and well, we need to know it too. We're not faithful because of an equation. The men and women of the Bible remained faithful because of what had already happened. Because God became flesh and God dwelt among us to demonstrate that God is for us. To demonstrate that God is for you. And at the center of Christianity is it's the best possible person who lived the best possible life. The person who chose the worst possible end, though, for us. And 
This is God's way of saying to us that even when your dreams can't come true, I still love you. So when your heart is broken, when your dreams cannot come true, when my heart is broken and when my dreams can't come true, that's our cue. Not to run, not to manipulate, not to take matters into our own hands, not to reach for Goliath's sword, but instead to lean into the moment, to look up and to reach out. The very opposite of what we feel like doing in those moments, right? To lean in, to look up and to reach out to the God who has made your whole world in God's hands. Now that's the time to pray along with David and millions since then. Let's pray. God, I offer you my dreams and plans. Do with me whatever seems good to you. I acknowledge your right to rule and lead me. Your will be done. I offer you my dreams and my plans because you care about me. Do with me whatever seems good to you. Amen. I have a few quick announcements for you. The first is that we would love to help you get connected at Sycamore Creek. We'd like to help you take next steps where you can grow in your faith. You can do that and more by filling out a digital connection card at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash connection. Please take a moment and fill out that digital connection card. If you do that for the first time, we have a free gift we will send you right from Amazon to your house. It's a book by Max Lucado called You'll Get Through This. We recognize that often life is difficult and we need hope and encouragement. We are wrapping up today our groups and events sign up period. Uh, if you have not already signed up for a group or for an event, well, time is running out. Today is the last day. You can do that at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash small groups. You'll see our list of groups there and you can sign up for a group using that link. There's all kinds of different things that will be happening over the next several months. Now be sure to check that out, even if you're not going to sign up for an event so that you're aware of what's happening. Today is also the deadline for our registration for our marriage retreat, which is coming up next weekend on February 17 and 18. I'm really excited about what we're going to be covering and how it's going to help marriages through that time together. Today again is the deadline to sign up for that marriage retreat. Coming up uh, later in February, on February 22, we'll have an Ash Wednesday worship service that'll be in person at our South Lansing campus. All of our campuses of Sycamore Creek are coming together at South Lansing to worship. That'll also be uh, live streamed online on Facebook and YouTube. And that's February 22, that Ash Wednesday at 7 p.m. Coming up on Sunday, February 26, we'll have an open mic night starting at four o'clock in the cafe in Potterville. Come and share your musical talent, share your poetry, uh, whatever it might be, share your talent with us. And uh, maybe you don't have a talent, but you wanna come and listen to someone. Come and be a part of a fun uh, afternoon uh, or open mic night at 4 p.m. on the 26th. I wanna thank you for your giving to support the mission of Sycamore Creek Church. Giving is important for the mission of our church. Giving is also important in your life and it has an impact on you. I want to encourage you, if you have not given before to Sycamore Creek, to consider giving to the mission of Sycamore Creek Church. You can do that at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash give. Your, your giving makes all sorts of things possible, including the fun tubing event that we had at the end of January at Birchfield Park. Uh, we had a fantastic time that afternoon. The snow conditions were perfect. The weather was perfect, which was amazing considering that it was a rescheduled event. Uh, we had all kinds of people of all ages who got together and had fun tubing. Uh, we, one of the most fun things I think we did was we got big, huge groups of people together on tubes and were able to go down together. Uh, we had a great time together connecting with one another, um, enjoying a fun activity, enjoying being outside. And now I wanna thank you for your giving that allows us to do fun events like that where we deepen our connections with each other and we're able to meet some new friends as we have fun together. Here is Kevin with our final worship song.
takes the horn the holy thunder leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place you would bear my cross You wouldn't lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me it Brings our chaos into order Son and daughter, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing. take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me. Conquer the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down your life that I would be you've done for me Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me have a great week go in peace I hope to see you again soon